Good morning and welcome to a very different looking deanery garden at Canterbury Cathedral. We've come outside to show you the complete transformation that the continuous falling snow over the last more than 24 hours now has brought to us and uh, it's a beautiful sight to see. The snow has carpeted all the gardens, the little growing plants are snug under the snow, it has a very protective quality to them. And as we say our prayers from across the world, well enjoy the winter landscape and bring your own concerns and prayers on this Monday the 8th of February as we come together early in the morning. I must say that my friend Leo here, who's covered in snow, isn't caring about it this morning. He's had wonderful games with the snow jumping in it and allowing the, the uh, flakes to fall all over him. I don't know how long that will last. Let's begin our prayers. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. May Christ's day star dawn in our hearts and triumph over the shades of night. Bless the Lord, all you works of the Lord. Sing his praise and exalt him forever. Bless the Lord, you heavens. Sing his praise and exalt him forever. Bless the Lord, you angels of the Lord. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts. Bless the Lord, you waters above the heavens. Sing his praise and exalt him forever. Bless the Lord, sun and moon. Bless the Lord, you stars of heaven. Bless the Lord, all rain and dew. Sing his praise and exalt him forever. Bless the Lord, all winds that blow. Bless the Lord, you fire and heat. Bless the Lord, scorching wind and bitter cold. Sing his praise and exalt him forever. Bless the Lord, dews and falling snows. Bless the Lord, you nights and days. Bless the Lord, light and darkness. Sing his praise and exalt him forever. Bless the Lord, frost and cold. Bless the Lord, ice and snow. Blessed be God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. And as we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. Our psalm this morning, on the eighth morning of the month, is Psalm 40. And I'm going to read the beginning of that psalm now. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me out of the roaring pit, out of the mire and clay, he set my feet upon a rock and made my footing sure. He has put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many shall see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not turn to the proud that follow a lie. Great are the wonders you have done, O Lord my God. How great your designs for all of us! There is none that can be compared with you. If I were to proclaim and tell of them, they would be more than I am able to express. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but my ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sacrifice for sin you have not required. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me that I should do your will, O my God. I delight to do it. Your law is within my heart. I have declared your righteousness in the great congregation. Behold, I did not restrain my lips, and that, O Lord, you know. Your righteousness I have not hidden in my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and truth from the great congregation. Do not withhold your compassion from me, O Lord. Let your love and your faithfulness always preserve me. So we turn to the sixth chapter of the Gospel of St Mark, and I'm beginning just where we left off yesterday, 
at verse 53. When Jesus and his disciples had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognised Jesus and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. It's a wonderful little paragraph ending that dramatic chapter which we've read over the last three days. And we see once again the boat bringing Jesus and his disciples. We've gone back to that word because they are learners in this and finding the lessons hard just after they'd been called, as we said yesterday, apostles on the return from their mission two by two because they were so exuberant about the things that they had been able to share with the people and the authority they seemed to have and then suddenly it all collapsed with the inability to understand the true vocation of that which Jesus was discovering about the ministry of the Christ, the Anointed One, bringing the quality of the Kingdom of Heaven and the gift of the Divine Spirit to our humanity. And yet the psalm, which Jesus must have known very well, because he of course would have had the psalms as his constant companions, and none better than Psalm 40, in the scroll of the book it is written of me that I should do your will, O my God. I delight to do it. Your law is within my heart. But even more so in verse 8. Burnt offering and sacrifice for sin you have not required. Then said I, lo, I come. The response of Jesus, the human figure of Jesus, to the divine vocation as the Christ, the Messiah, which is now being shared with those who are disciples, learners, as they go across the lake and land on the northwestern shore between Capernaum and Magdala, farther south, in what might be called the Plain of Gennesaret there. And this is a, a, a general pericope, little piece, which Mark has put at the end of chapter 6, gathering up all the things that were happening. See how he says, walking about in villages, in cities, in towns, out in the countryside, and the people racing to enjoy this ministry. Perhaps it's time for us to think how Mark has shaped his Gospel. For in this Gospel, Jesus goes up to Jerusalem only once. Mark has so arranged it that the Galilean ministry comes first and in that Jesus himself is a learner. He's reacting to the people's needs but he's also reacting to all those psalms and pieces of prophecy and the law inside him, known by heart, reacting to the sentences which speak to him, anew and afresh. He's just come down from the mountain and joined the turbulent boat in the, in the waters and created calm. And now they've come to Gennesaret and the ministry continues. Mark has strung all those Galilean episodes together right at the beginning of the Gospel and takes us into chapter 7 and then into chapter 8. These will become extremely significant chapters for us. And happily we're able to conclude that Galilean ministry before we get to Ash Wednesday on the 17th of February. For the Gal Galilean ministry is the crucible in which Jesus works out in 
almost a white heat of prayer with the Father and interaction with the Twelve and the wider band of those following him and the townsfolk and their need of his own country, Galilee, rural Galilee, by the lakeside. And we shall go on now up until Ash Wednesday with St Mark and that will allow us to complete the Galilean ministry and that learning of them all, but there's much more to learn because then St Mark takes us on further and then begins the journey to Jerusalem, taken just once. In St John's Gospel, and we shall be with St John's Gospel through the first weeks of Lent, there are several journeys up to Jerusalem and back to other areas. But in St Mark, only one. Let's remind ourselves this isn't a biography, it's a setting out of the good news of Jesus Christ who in the first verse of his Gospel, the evangelist proclaims the Son of God. Jesus himself referring constantly to himself as Son of Man, the symbol of our humanity. That word in the Greek for man there is, is one which includes us all of whatever gender not like the one at the end of the feeding of the 5,000, which was very much sort of signifying almost an army in groups, as we saw. And that's very much men, a very different word. But, but on this occasion, we are thinking of a, a little, I don't know, a, a, a collection, a, 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 almost a mosaic of the ministry in Galilee on the shores of the lakeside at Gennesaret a place that Jesus would have known well, not too far from home. And remember, we've had the hidden 30 years of his life, the life of, as St Mark says, the carpenter, and says that in the mouths, remember, of his friends and neighbours when he is at home, just a, a, a chapter or two ago. So let's give thanks for that Galilean ministry as we continue tomorrow and the day after with that story. Tomorrow we drop back into controversy. But for today, it's a hopeful and good chapter of the fruitful ministry of Jesus and the Twelve. So let's just think for a moment about things which have happened on this date in the past. We're talking about February the 8th and um, some tragic things have happened on this day. Mary, Queen of Scots, was beheaded. One of the hardest decisions Queen Elizabeth I was ever forced to make after evidence of Mary's complicity in the Babington plot to, to murder her, Elizabeth I. Um, but nevertheless, her heart was wrung to pieces as having to sign as the sovereign the political head of state and she in the end does sign and Mary Queen of Scots is executed on this day. Perhaps even harder on this day in 1601 the Earl of Essex which she'd had a close and it's thought to be romantic relationship with um, uh, raised a revolution against her and it lasted only three weeks and then the wisdom of her counsellors, when they had captured Essex, said this man also must be executed. And the Queen had to just send them away and, and think and it with her heart and mind all through this. So it's a day for remembering hard political decisions that our leaders have to make. Uh, not generally these days about death penalties, but nevertheless hard political decisions and they're doing it on our behalf and for the stability of the state. And then we think more happily in 1693 that in the United States the College of William and Mary was founded by charter of King William and Queen Mary who reigned jointly here at the end of the 17th century. And we have a close connection here because at the College of William and Mary there is a Canterbury chaplain and our good friend Tyler Montgomery held that for several years. He's not there now, but we keep in touch with him. And it's near colonial Williamsburg, which maybe some of you have been to, where the 
time is reenacted of uh, about, um, I don't know, 1775 or so, and it's a wonderful place to go. And Bruton Parish Church, which is the old parish church in the middle of that, uh, is a, a place where the Canterbury chaplain, under the rector, Chris Epperson, when we were there, um, was uh, uh, car carrying out a parish ministry as well as a college ministry. So our prayers over there and uh, giving thanks for our connection with that from Canterbury. What else do we have on this day? Strange things, like in 1855, mysterious devil's footprints appearing in South Devon in the snow. We've no idea how that happened, but the tail certainly grew, shall we say, grew legs. And uh, you see he has mysterious footsteps in the snow, and we know it's, it's Leo. Uh, and uh, then in 1983, the horse Shergar was captured, uh, kidnapped, and never reappeared. The ransom demanded for this Aga Khan's derby winner was two million pounds and it was never paid and the horse never reappeared. And then what else do we remember? That James Dean, sadly, who was born on this day in 1931, uh, and rem we remember that he died in 1955 in a car accident and is, his legend continues even though he was only in three films really. And then perhaps I would want to remember Iris Murdoch, who died on this day in 1999, a novelist, a philosopher, who was brought by Archbishop Runcie when he was the principal of the seminary in Cunston to help us understand relationships and morality and that which is divine and philosophy and so on. Uh, a, a great person. And uh, we remember also her husband, John Bailey. But um, I, uh, I like best her book, The Bell, and, uh, which she published in 1958. She died after two years of total Alzheimer's, which is a, an extraordinary thing with that wonderful mind. But it causes us to remember those who have to look after people with Alzheimer's and that was well told in John Bailey's book and in the film Iris. 1828 Jules Verne was born, a man of such imagination he could be called the father of all those, uh, um, what would you call it, um, science and, and, and uh, uh, the, the, the kind of books which take us out into outer space and all of those things. Um, so uh, let's remember his journey to the centre of the earth, his uh, from the earth to the moon when the rocket went up, his 20,000 leagues under the sea with the Nautilus submarine and Captain Nemo, and perhaps best of all around the world in 80 days. He was writing in the 1860s, none of those things were happening, his imagination was absolutely massive. And so we remember him today with thanksgiving because most of us have seen one film or another about, uh, based on those books and they've been translated into just about every, every language. Well that brings me probably to the person that I wanted to remember most this morning and that's John Ruskin. He lived from 1819 <coughs> to 1900 and was very much an interpreter of creative art architecture and all kinds of ways in which humanity joins its creator in being creative. He was a man whose parents had taught him the scriptures almost by heart. His mother used to say chapters of the scriptures with him saying alternate verses and that stayed with him through quite a pilgrimage of faith and doubt and faith and yet at the same time his own exploration went on. He said, I'm going to quote two of his things, it would take all morning to talk about Ruskin, but he said, no true disciple of mine will ever be a Ruskinian but will follow not me but the instincts of their own soul and the guidance of its creator. He was one who wrote about the painting of Turner 
and the Pre-Raphaelites and those who by their painting and their realism explored the depths of creation. Well, this would make the most wonderful painting today here. But Ruskin was interested in actually explaining in the best possible way for words were really his medium and he was respected for it. Tolstoy described him as one of the most remarkable men not only of England of our generation but of all countries and all times. What a, what a tribute from Leo Tolstoy. But just as Tolstoy translated his work into Russian, Gandhi quoted him extensively and translated his work into languages that his own people could understand and Proust translated him into French. Three very different characters, Tolstoy, Gandhi and Proust, and yet the influence of Ruskin on writers and artists all over the world continues. And we remember his seven lamps of architecture and in that the lamps were moral categories for architects building for people, building anything for people. Sacrifice, truth, power, beauty, life, memory and obedience. And then his books, The Stones of Venice, where he extolled the beauties of Venice and began to explore not it, restoration, which half the time destroyed what was there, but conservation and preservation and making sure that things were safe, just as the snow is, is actually protecting all the tender things which are growing. So he wanted a preservation and an atmosphere and an ecology which would protect what was very fine in creation. He wrote them while staying in the Hotel Daniele. Well, those of you who know that, uh, a wonderful hotel. The last time we were there, it was at Aqua Alta. And I remember the, the magnificent front hall being actually a lake, but they were quite used to it. The marble floors uh, were simply given little stands and, and duck boards to walk across as we went out and then opposite, and you could see it better from the bedroom window, that marvellous sight across to the Chiesa di San Giorgio Maggiore and across the, the gondolas, just the, the, the most wonderful part of, of, of Venice to look at. But for, for Ruskin, it was a time to think and he wrote, there is no wealth but life, life, including all its powers of love, of joy and of admiration. That country is the richest which nourishes the greatest number of noble and happy human beings. That person is richest who having perfected the functions of their own life to the utmost has always the widest helpful influence, both personal and by means of their possessions, over the lives of others. It was that which attracted Gandhi, that kind of statement. So from his Christian foundations, he was able to talk to people as diverse as Tolstoy and as uh, Proust and Gandhi and a host of others and um, I wish we could talk about him a bit more this morning, but there we are. Let's say our prayers on this snowy morning, and this morning I actually have brought the right sheet. So <clears throat> let me first of all pray for those I missed yesterday having brought the wrong sheet, and that was the, dia the, uh, the, the um, diocese of um, uh, the Anglican Church of Burundi, and then also the parish in our diocese of Headcorn and the Suttons under their priest Fiona Haskett and this morning the 8th of the month then we're praying in the Anglican Communion for the diocese of St Andrews, Dunkeld and Dunblane in the Scottish Episcopal Church and in this diocese for Archbishop Justin and for Bishop Rose of Dover, for Bishop Tim at Lambeth and the parish of Marden, St Michael and All Angels and for Nicola Harvey in her ministry there and all the people of those parishes. 
Well, bring your own prayers and intentions on this snowy morning here, whatever the weather is like for you, but most of all, bring those whom you would want to pray for in whatever kind of danger or necessity or joy that they find themselves in, or simply because they come to mind with anything that we've said this morning. Here is the prayer for this week. Almighty God, you have created the heavens and the earth and made us in your own image. Teach us to discern your hand in all your works and your likeness in all your children. <clears throat> Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit reigns supreme over all things, now and forever. Amen. So we say, each in our own language, the prayer our Saviour taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. A moment here then in the silence of the snow, and for you in silence to make your own prayers and intentions. the peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you, upon those whom you love, and those whom you would pray for, today and always. Amen.